Most of us here this morning would probably differ on whether it was ever right to bomb Vietnam. I think we would. If we were to take polls or to begin a debate, probably all of us in the theatre would differ in some way from each other. Because we have finite minds and we have different backgrounds and it just is possible for Christians who are really close together in the spirit to honestly differ on issues that seem superficially to be very, very clear. And so most of us would probably differ on whether it was right to bomb Vietnam or not. Maybe a majority would feel in in one way, but there would be a difference. However, I think I'm safe in saying that all of us would agree that one of the problems in the bombing was bombing military supplies and avoiding the destruction of hospitals and schools. And all of us would agree that even the selective bombing, which was planned to do that, fell far short. And I think all of us, therefore, in the theatre would agree that that was wrong. Wherever a hospital, wherever a home, whatever your political view is, it was always wrong to destroy innocent people. And I think that's one of the real tragedies we would see in the guerrilla warfare that is so prevalent in different parts of the world today. It is this old business of the destruction of the military powers and the destruction of innocent powers along with them. Now, brothers and sisters, that's just a crude example of a problem that runs through the lives of all of us who are human beings and the life of the creator of the universe himself. And the problem is this, how to destroy what is evil without destroying also what is good. And that's the real problem that the creator of the universe faces every day and that you and I face, and that medical people face. Uh, You know what's the difficulty with the whole business of deep ray uh, therapy in connection with certain kinds of cancer. The problem is to find a ray that will pass through normal cells and tissue without destroying them at all. And yet when it comes to the abnormal cells and tissue, will destroy them. The whole difficulty is to get some ray that will destroy the evil or the diseased part of the body while leaving alive the good parts or the healthy parts. Now, that's the basic problem of our dear Creator, really. And uh, you can see it in various places, but you could see it in Genesis 18 if, if you want to look there. It's stated very clearly by Abraham in that record of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember God decided that the two communities had rebelled against him so much that there was just no point in letting them continue. And so he determined to wipe them off the face of the earth. And you get this problem of destroying the evil and preserving the good brought up in Abraham's prayer to God. Uh, Genesis 18 and verse 23, and Abraham is praying to the Father, and it's page 13, do you in that black RSV. And verse 23 of Genesis 18, Then Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou indeed destroy the righteous with the wicked? And you see, that was the question. Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city, wilt thou then destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? And then, this is God's nature, you see, and this is the dilemma that he faces. Far be it from thee to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. So, obviously, God did not have to think a a second time. Obviously, with an infinite mind such as he had, he had already decided this issue in the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. But he allowed this conversation to be recorded to bring before us men and women that this was a real issue that he had to face. 
that there was a real difficulty that a holy and loving God had to face when he met evil. If he was really holy, he had to destroy the evil, but if he was really loving, he had to preserve the good. And this was the difficulty that ran through all God's dealings, really, with men. If a God was loving, then he wouldn't just wipe out the evil and the good together. He would destroy just the evil. And yet, if he was really loving, he would want to destroy the evil for the sake of the others who had to be preserved. Now, we saw, you remember last Sunday, that again God faced that problem when us men, we men and women, decided to live independent of him for our own motives of profit, power and success. You remember at that time, God had to come down and destroy the whole place with a flood. And uh, you remember that same problem comes up, Genesis 6 and verses 6 through 8. Genesis 6 and 6 through 8, it's page 5. And again there was the problem, all right, there was some evil here, but there was also some good. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the ground, man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And you see that problem coming up again, how to destroy the evil and yet preserve what was good. And I think all of us would agree that a holy and just God is committed to destroying evil. I think you'd agree with that. If you're really a holy God, then you destroy all unholiness. If you really think that holiness is the thing and is the thing that will make people happiest, then you'll destroy its opposite every time you come across it. So I think most of us would agree with that. And don't you think that all of us, from our own subjective personal experiences, would agree that there must somewhere be in the universe a supernatural power that is able to destroy that evil will that we find so often inside us. I think most of us would agree with that. That there probably isn't one of us here who has not found within us a selfish evil will that we cannot tackle ourselves. And we know somewhere there has to be a power that is so supernatural and so mighty and so loving and so just that he'll destroy this wherever he sees it and yet preserve me myself. I don't think there's one of us here that has really not found that resentment rising up inside us which knots our stomach. I don't think there's one of us here that has not found that anger flaming out against those we ought to love. And we know, yeah, somebody must be able to destroy that. And we've tried to destroy these things ourselves, but we're unable to. Or we've found that sarcasm that drops so quickly from our lips when we're in a debate or a discussion with somebody. And we say, there must be somebody who can destroy that rising sarcasm inside me. Or we fought that lust that fills our minds with perverted thoughts for so long that we feel there must be somebody who can destroy that lust. In other words, there probably isn't one of us here this morning who wouldn't say, yeah, yeah, I've tried to destroy those things inside myself for years, and I can't. And those things are destroying my life. Yes, there must be some supernatural power who is able to destroy that. But loved ones, the problem is to destroy it and preserve us. Now you may say, well, why, if God is able to do this, why do so many of us, even those who call ourselves Christians, why do we live in the midst of lives that are limited by lust? In the midst of lives that are spoiled by sarcasm? In the midst of lives that are destroyed by our anger and our bad temper? Why do we live this way if God himself is actually able to destroy these things? Well, I think one of the reasons is that we have never really seen that that is the issue dealt with in Jesus' death. We really haven't seen that that's the problem that God solved in Jesus' death. How to destroy evil and preserve us at the same time. How to avoid wiping us off the face of the earth forever with a flood. That's the issue that is dealt with in the death of Jesus. Now, of course, for years, 
we have not been taught that. For years we've been taught that Jesus' death doesn't deal with that at all. We've been taught that Jesus' death enables God to love us. We've been taught for years God hated us until Jesus died in Calvary and then from then on he loved us along with our sin. In actual fact, God has always loved us and he's always hated our sin. But for years we've been taught that Jesus died to enable God to love us because before he died he did not love us. That's why secular psychologists will often differ from the evangelical Christian world today. And in some things they'll be right. Because they'll say, that's silly. Don't tell people that God doesn't love them. God loves them. God loves even the rebellious people. And in that they're right. The psychologists are right. God has always loved us. The purpose of Jesus' death wasn't to enable God to love us. It was to deal with the other issue that we mentioned at the beginning. The tragedy with the secular psychologist is, he says, God not only loves you, but there's no evil in you that is bad enough to cause you any guilt. So you shouldn't have any guilt. But it's rather interesting, the evangelicals do the same thing, actually. Because they say, God can't love you until Jesus died for you. But now that Jesus has died, God loves you and loves your sin as well. So you can come with your sin, and God will keep loving you. And so, both the secular psychologist and the ordinary evangelical ends up producing the same terrible, unscriptural person. A person who lives without guilt in the midst of his sin. And really, so often, that's what has put us off churches and Christianity. We've seen a lot of people who said, Oh, God has forgiven me my sins, but they're living in the midst of anger and in the midst of strife and in the midst of argument and in the midst of hatred. So many of us were put off churches because we find the official board arguing and disagreeing with one another and hating one another and talking about one another after service. Now that's what results, dear ones, from thinking that the death of Jesus is there to show us the love of God. The death of Jesus isn't there for that at all. And yet we've been encouraged to believe that. The issue in Jesus' death is not God's love. God loves every one of us in this theater this morning. God loves the prostitute that is at this moment is engaged in intercourse in some little apartment in Paris. God loves that dear girl. Loves her with all his heart. God loves the member of the mafia who is at this moment planning to murder someone else. God loves that man. Brothers and sisters, the issue is not God's love. God loves us all. The issue is, how can a God who is loving accept rebellious people without destroying their rebellion? And the answer is, of course, he has to find some way to destroy their rebellion in order to accept them at all. Now, you'll find that God was always loving. Even if you go back to the first murderer, you'll see it. Genesis 4 there. If you look at Genesis 4, you'll see that the father never had trouble loving Those of us who were sinners. You remember Cain was the first one to murder in the world. Genesis 4 and verse 10 it is. It's the bottom of page 3 there on that black RSV. Genesis 4 and 10. And the Lord said, what have you done to Cain, you see? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield to its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. But in actual fact, it wasn't. God could have given him a punishment that was greater than he could bear. He could have destroyed him. But instead, he designed a plan whereby Cain could, if he wanted, come back to God. Behold, thou hast driven me this day away from the ground. And from thy face I shall be hidden. And I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will slay me. And God even showed his love in protecting him. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who came upon him should kill him. And so God really arranged for a plan that would enable Cain to come back to the father if he wanted him to. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. In other words, God did not fail to love Cain And he actually provided a way for him to come back to him. 
And God does love sinners, do not It's obvious, John 8 and verse 3, you know. I, I kind of love there that many of us would be slow to express. Primarily because I think we are so hyper-conscious of sexual sins. Uh, and I think un- unfairly. So we, we often don't see criticism of others as being as serious, and it really is. But Genesis, 3 and verse, uh, Genesis 8 and verse 3, you remember in the RSV it appears in the footnote, because some of the manuscripts don't have it. And Genesis 8 and verse 3 down at the bottom of the page, 931. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such. What do you say about her? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the eldest. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus looked up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. Go and do not sin again. The issue dealt at Calvary was not God's love. God loved us. The issue dealt with at Calvary was how to destroy the evil in you and me and yet enable us to keep on living. Unfortunately, you know, a totally imaginary issue has been raised down through the years as the one dealt with at Calvary. And that was that God couldn't forgive us and didn't love us until he was able to kill Jesus in our place. And then, after he killed the wrong person, he was suddenly able to love us. Well, even to a child, this seems ridiculous. It seems that God is a petulant tyrant who won't love until he gets a sacrifice offered to him. Now, brothers and sisters, that wasn't what happened at Calvary. What happened at Calvary was that God actually destroyed the evil in you and me in Jesus so that we would be able to stay alive ourselves. But this other idea is taught so much that we begin to feel, ah, Jesus died so that God could love us. And so you know what happens when we come to a verse like Romans 6 and 3. Uh, Then we interpret it purely symbolically. And Romans 6 and verse 3, you remember it runs, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And so with our normal interpretation of Jesus' death as being the step that enabled God to love us, we kind of say, Ah, Paul, you've done it again. Beautiful metaphor. Beautiful metaphor. We can see that we're baptized into God's family because Jesus' death enables God to love us. And so that's a lovely metaphor that you have. You're just as cool as ever with your little illustrations. You're saying in a kind of strange sense that we've been baptized into Jesus' death. Oh, that's neat. We know it's not true, but it's neat. Because we understand, Paul, that of course Jesus died instead of us. That was the whole point. Jesus died instead of us so that God would have his anger satisfied and he could forgive us. But that's our neat metaphor that you have. A neat little illustration. And that's really, loved ones, the way the greater part, I think, of the Christian world has looked at Romans 6. They've looked at it as as a metaphor and as a symbol. And they've said, that's a beautiful symbol. We know, of course, we're not baptized into Jesus' death. We know we're here, bright and alive and living. And we know that Jesus died so that we wouldn't have to die. And so, we know it's just a metaphor. And yet, it sticks in your throat, you know, as you go on to the next verse. Because you feel that old Paul is beginning to draw out a metaphor rather too far and beginning to be a bit ridiculous about it because you can accept a metaphor but when you begin to build a whole truth of regeneration and sanctification upon a metaphor and its extension then you begin to feel the fellow must be illogical and so he goes on in Romans 6 and 4 we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death and loved ones I know it sounds ridiculous But the bulk of the Christian world has hoiled up his hands in horror and said, Now, Paul, back off. Back off. Buried with him? Now, don't carry it too far. We can see that in some strange sense you can say that we're baptized into his death. But don't say now we're buried with him. Because we know that didn't happen. 
In other words, loved ones, you can't interpret this symbolically. You can't interpret these uh, verses as a beautiful metaphor. You have to begin to see that what God did in Jesus' death was to take the evil will, the evil selfish will that produces the lust and the anger and the pride in you and me, and God destroyed it in Jesus. That's the only way a just and holy God could ever forgive people like ourselves. You see, God has always loved us. There's no problem with that. But as a just and holy God, God can never forgive rebellion. You can see that in ordinary political things. In ordinary political affairs, you can't forgive rebellion. You can forgive rebels after they lay down their arms. But you can't forgive rebellion. You can't forgive a person who continues to be angry and continues to lust. That would be encouraging the very destruction that you sent the flood to stop and to limit when it first occur occurred in the world. In other words, God is loving to all of us. He loves every one of us in this theater. You know, He loves you whatever you have done. Brothers and sisters, there's no problem with that. Nobody's disagreeing with that. God loves every one of us with all his heart in this theater. He knows you by name. But he can never love the evil in you. Because if he does, he knows that will destroy his world. And so the only way he can ever forgive you is to put the evil in you into his son, Jesus, and in the cosmic, eternal event of Jesus' death on Calvary, destroy that evil by the supernatural power of his Holy Spirit. And that's what Calvary is all about. God destroyed the rebellion there so that he could forgive the rebels. He destroyed the lust there so that he could forgive the prostitute. He destroyed the dishonesty and the lies there so that he could forgive the thief. He destroyed the sarcasm there so that he could forgive the shrew. He destroyed the cruelty there so that he could forgive the tyrant. But that's what happened in Jesus' death. And that's more and more the way we need to see it. And that's what you and I have not done for so long. We've taken a purely intellectual attitude to Jesus' death and thought, oh yeah, it's a nice illustration that God loves us with all his heart and he's prepared to forgive us. No. Unless we come into a real, vital, subjective experience of Jesus' death, God cannot eliminate the evil in us so that in fact he will be able to preserve the good. And so there is a real need, brothers and sisters, to see that Paul really means what he says. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And you may say, well, brother, I mean, I still have lust. And I still have envy and anger in my heart. And it comes up again and again and I cannot control it. What do I do? Well, brothers and sisters, begin to see that God, by a miracle, dealt with that in Jesus. First of all, see that it has been destroyed by God. Then see that you need to enter into this experientially yourself. And it is possible, loved ones. That's why we talk about the victorious life. It is possible to live above lust and above anger and above pride and above jealousy. If you are really willing to take part in actual fact in the death in which you have taken part historically as far as God is concerned. In other words, begin to ask the Holy Spirit and ask him, Holy Spirit, I can see that this was destroyed in Jesus' death on Calvary, but it hasn't been destroyed in me. Now will you begin to show me and will you begin to reveal to me how this can take place in me? Now, just one other thing, brothers and sisters. I agree with you that a lot of us have not known this light. I agree. I was, br I was not brought up in this. I was brought up to believe the old system that God didn't love me until Jesus died for me. Then God was able to love me along with my sin. So I wasn't brought up this way. So if you say, now this is kind of a shock to me, brother. How do I face this? Brothers and sisters... If you have really received Jesus' spirit in a new birth experience, then your spirit will rise to this. 
And you'll say, look, if this is what enabled God to justify me and to be justified and forgiven me through his destruction of evil in Jesus, then this is what I want in my own life. But if you have not really received Jesus' Spirit, then when you come to this truth, you'll back off from it. You'll call it an ascetic experience. Or you'll call it extremism. Or you'll say, no, no, this isn't the gospel. But brothers and sisters, if the Spirit in you is really the Spirit of Jesus, then you will rise to this and you will say, well, it isn't real yet in my own life. But that's what I want. If, Father, you could only forgive me by destroying the evil in me and Jesus, then I want that made real in my own life. And you know it appeals, doesn't it, that one? I mean, it appeals to you. A holy God can't suddenly change his mind and say, I don't mind lust or anger or anything. You know, he can't. He can't suddenly change his mind because of even the death of his son and say, no, I no longer hate those things. I want a heaven full of people who lust and are angry and are envious and jealous. It just doesn't make sense. It just makes sense to us, doesn't it, that a holy God has to find some way of destroying the evil in us and yet enabling us to stay alive. And the way is by entering into Jesus' death by faith so that we don't have to enter into a physical death such as was caused by the flood. My loved ones, I'll stop there just for a moment and I know that sometimes you don't want to ask questions, I understand that. But we would have maybe... Maybe 30 seconds, okay, for a question. <laughs> if you get in before 30 seconds, it can be longer. Just anxious. I, now, I, we'll be on Romans 6 for some time, so you'll have plenty of opportunity to begin to get the, the implications of it. So don't be concerned if you don't grasp it all, you know, this morning. Yeah. John says, you know, what about those who haven't died understanding this light? And I think of my dad who died as a Christian and certainly knew nothing about uh, the teaching of the Holy Spirit or the teaching of the cross of Christ. In this sense, he understood the forgiveness of sins. And it seems to me we're judged by the light that's given us, John. And that the Father lovingly accepts us according to the way we've responded to the light that he has shown us. Yeah. No, in other words, we're not teaching something extra above salvation. We're saying this is what salvation includes. Now let's see all of what we've entered into. Don says, yes, Don says, then what does God do with the evil that is in men? Well, he deals with it according to their reception of what he has already shown them. And he begins to destroy that evil in them even now. Yeah. The same as, you remember, he must have dealt with the Old Testament people before Jesus died. In fact, Jesus visited hell, you remember, to deal with those Old Testament people. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Sister says what I think many of us have been thinking. Uh, surely at death you'll never have all the evil destroyed in you and it's a matter of just saying to God well I've tried uh, I've tried to obey you and I know there's a lot in me that is still wrong and that's something of what will be changed and you'll never enter into perfection now it seems brothers and sisters that Jesus plainly told us that there will be a mighty change that is wrought when we die and there will be many ways in which we have not entered into the perfection of God we won't have his perfect mind. We won't have his perfect balanced emotions, though they should be much more balanced than they are by that time. And the mind should be a little more balanced than, than it is at the moment. But you're right that obviously we won't be in the absolute perfection of God and there will have to be a mighty change wrought when we die. Nevertheless, sister, it is false to claim that there is no degree of perfect obedience that can come about in this life. It seems that Jesus, you remember, meant something when he said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He had been just talking about the love of God. And he obviously meant, be at least perfect in love. And it does seem, sister, that as we go on through in Romans 6, we begin to see that God's will is for us to be perfect in our obedience. We cannot be perfect in the sense that we conform absolutely to his perfection in every detail. We'll still make mistakes. We'll still do things by ignorance. We'll still do things unintentionally. 
But we can come to a place where we can obey him perfectly. That is, we can do what we know we ought to do. And that's, I think, what we're talking about. We're talking about that anger that we know we shouldn't have. And we, that's the stuff that brings guilt to our hearts and that destroys our family life. We're talking about those things that we know are wrong and that we cannot overcome. Those are the things that God can change in Jesus' death. Yeah. And it seems to me for so long, you see, for so long, uh, we, we who have been in Christian churches have excused ourselves. We have said, no, no, we're only human. We can't be free of these things. While the dear humanist has been looking in and saying, I live a far more ethical life than you do. Why should I want Jesus? And so I think it's important for us sisters to see that yes, there is some perfection that we can only enter into when we die. But there is a perfect obedience that it is God's will for us to enter into in this life. Yeah. Yet, we are never justified by that perfect obedience. We are justified only by one thing, by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. So, brothers and sisters, will you, now will you keep thinking and keep alive on the issue so that you, you can you know, push me either with written questions or at the end. Maybe just quickly, brother. Yeah. No, it seems to... Does the perfect obedience contribute to our salvation? No. Otherwise, it's salvation by works. It seems, brother, the perfect obedience is a result of salvation, not a condition of it. Yeah. There's only one condition of salvation, and that is being willing to identify ourselves with Jesus as much as the Holy Spirit reveals to us we should do. In other words, to believe ourselves, the Greek is, into Jesus, to believe, in Je believe into Jesus. No, loved ones, what we're talking about now, all in Romans 6, is the result of salvation. What I'm trying to say to you is, look, you've entered into a great hall, now let's put on the lights and see what is in this hall. That's really what I'm saying. And you've come into it, now let's see what is in it. And these are some of the beauties that I think we have missed. You know. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you that there is only one reason why you can accept us and that is because Jesus has died and Father we thank you for that but we thank you that the reason you are able to accept us because of his death is that there in him you destroyed the evil that is in us and by the power of the Holy Spirit you can graciously make that real in our own lives here today Father we know that we'll always perhaps be on the stage uh, on the way to experiencing this fully. But Father, we tell you, we want to experience as much of it as possible while we're still alive here. Father, we want others to see your son Jesus, not to see our ugliness. And so we trust you by the Holy Spirit to begin to deal with us more and more so that we will see and we will enter into the reality that we were buried with Jesus by baptism into death so that as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might begin to walk in newness of life. And we trust that this newness of life will fill the world, our Father, with your glory and with your will. We ask this in your name. Amen.